uh, anyone else in the house agree that people are complicated? Can anyone testify? <laughs> Man, people are complicated. And, and it's not just like, like, for me, I'm like, dudes are complicated, but then like, for me, women are mysterious. Okay, and I, and I understand, I got two sons, I understand my sons. Okay, I've got a wife and a daughter, they are beautiful and mysterious. And God has just made us so beautifully different and all, you know, for his reasons. And, but, but life is complicated. And uh, what I've learned about my wife and my daughter is like, if they say they're okay, they're fine. If they say they're fine, we're all not okay. <laughs> so I'm learning to like interpret, you know, learn. And, uh, and again, there's just different things about us. You know, my wife, She'll say, you and the boys, you guys are too competitive. I'm like, I knew that before you did. <laughs> Some of you, it's 1030, wake up. It's 11, my goodness sakes. My, my daughter, she's a little Miss Chatty. One time, I didn't talk to her for three days. I didn't want to interrupt her. <laughs> Girl can chat, and she likes to talk. And my wife, you know, we handle things differently. So, like, I make a lot of mistakes. I've learned to just kind of roll with it. But to her, they weigh more on her. So I was trying to encourage her. I said, girl, you got to embrace your mistakes. Embrace them. She gave me a long hug. <laughs> I guess it meant a lot to her, what I had to say. She really wanted to hug it out. You guys... We're so different. Um, and so then God calls us as different as we are into this thing called marriage, right? And it's a mystery. And they say marriage is from above. Amen? But I've also learned so is lightning <laughs> and thunder and hail. So what is this mystery? And I realize a lot of people go into relationships with this ideal in their mind. Like, the, I'm going to have the ideal relationship, right? The ideal marriage. It's like, what is the ideal marriage? And, and, and we have this idea sometimes of it's going to look just like this. And then we get into it and it looks nothing like that. And we're like, oh my, what is this, right? Sometimes people don't even want to get into relationships because they're afraid they'll never be the ideal, right? So this idea of ideal will let us down or keep us from even trying, like to, to put ourselves out there, maybe to ask someone on a date or something like that, because this ideal of what is perfect, right? And, and so ideals, they come to you whether you're expecting it or not, right? You learn them from culture. They're in different places and they fill your mind and then they set your expectations, right? And so when it comes to ideals, what is, I'm just curious this morning, like in your mind, what does the ideal marriage look like? And before that, what is the ideal man? And before that, what is the ideal woman? And for a really long time in both Christian history and before that in Jewish history, in the Bible, there's been this picture of the ideal woman. And a lot of you know where this comes from, right? Proverbs. Okay, some of y'all have been in women's Bible study, right? And they call y'all the P31 woman, right? And everybody trying to be the P31. And so today I thought, you know what? We've been in this, this uh, series on Proverbs. I can't skip the last chapter because it's the exclamation point of the whole book. And, and so I thought, let's do it. Let's jump into this ideal passage or what has been taught as this ideal woman, right? And here's the reality too, just to, to have some fun with this. I've, I've heard people say like, Proverbs 31, it's intimidating. And by the way, it is intimidating. And I remember I was talking to one gal who was studying Proverbs 31. She said, man, I can't believe, like why did like, God lead uh, the author to write this whole chapter about like this ideal woman? And I was like, well, in reality, the first 30 chapters were aimed at the man, right? So it's like men got 30 chapters and then the ladies got one chapter. It's kind of like, I think God knew that what you need to tell a woman one time, you got to tell a man 30 times. You know what I mean? So God's coming for all of us today, okay? I'm not just picking at the ladies today. 
So here's what I want to do. I want to go through the whole chapter. Can we do that? Get your seatbelt on and can we rock and roll? And let's try to jump in and get through the whole chapter 31. It's the conclusion of, not the series, we're going to do one more message next week, but of this actual book of Proverbs. And it says this, Proverbs 31 verse 1. Pay attention though. This is context. This means everything to the whole message. So don't miss this. It says, the sayings of King Lemuel, the sayings of King Lemuel, an in inspired utterance his mother taught him. Okay, so Proverbs 31, the famous P31 chapter to women. I don't know if you caught this, but it is actually authored in the name of a guy named Lemuel. Maybe you never thought about that. Maybe you didn't know that. Here's the second thing you need to know. There's actually no Lemuel recorded in history. There's no king of Judah, no king of Israel in the north. There's not a recorded Jewish king named Lemuel. This is mysterious. But what if God is mysterious? How many of you know God is always deeper than you know? He's always doing something deeper. And we can make things so surface level. But I came to tell you in verse 1, it's already deeper than you've ever been taught. Deeper. Okay, so his mother taught him and said this, listen, my son, the son of my womb, listen, my son, who is the answer to my prayer. And so it's interesting to me that you have a mother speaking to a son who is a king, okay? Which means this, this is a young king who still has the voice of his mother speaking to him, right? So there would be an age where he would get to and he would have other advisors that would mean more to him. But what this is telling you is he's still at an age where his mother's voice is really impactful to him. He's probably a teenager. We know also that he wouldn't be king if his dad didn't die. Okay, so catch the context. Who is Lemuel? He's young, possibly a teenager, and he's got a good mom speaking wisdom into his life. How many can you appreciate, how many in here can appreciate a good mom who speaks good wisdom into your life? Anybody in the house today thankful for a good mother who speaks into the, the formative heart of, a, of a, a, a young king and she's literally pleading wisdom at this young teenager and watch this. She says this, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on the things that ruin kings. Okay, so this is interesting. And the first thing I want you to notice, and this is so true of every young man in the house, God has given you strength. And I love that she calls out in her young son and she says, listen, you are strong. And God has given you strength for a good purpose. And I wanna to speak to a young man in the house today. God has made you strong. In your youth, you have a strength about you. And guess what? That strength is to be used to serve in this world, not serve yourself. And there's a lot of ways you can send your strength that will not help you and will not help this world. But God has called you to better than that. And here's the wisdom of a mother saying, God gave you strength in all the wisdom I can pray for. Don't waste it. And it's amazing that this is 3,000 years ago. And she says, you know what will take your strength? Chasing women around. Sleeping around and getting intoxicated. So for the next couple of verses, she says, don't be a drunk. Don't be drinking. You're young. You don't need that. God's got better for you than getting into all these relationships and then also uh, uh, getting intoxicated with whatever that looks like. Back then it was wine and beer. Now there's a whole host of things you can get intoxicated by, right? Right? And so the wisdom of a mom says, listen, the strength will be pulled out of you if you do that. But God has a higher purpose for your strength. In other words, the key to your future, young man, is to be singular focus, one day, one woman, and sober. And then God will use that platform for great things. And if that don't preach to our culture right now, I don't know what does. But isn't it amazing that we haven't changed in 3,000 years? This was a word to a young teenage son 3,000 years ago. Uh, look at verse eight. This is really important. 
She says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So again, you're strong. You're gonna use that strength that God gave you and you're gonna speak up for people who cannot speak up for themselves and for the rights of those who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly and defend the rights of the poor and the needy. In other words, if you're strong, don't use your life to focus on building yourself up. Anyone else in the room tired of seeing leaders just build their own platforms to serve themselves? I don't know about you, but leadership is designed to help the greater whole. To look at like, hey, where are the needs? Let's all gather and let's, let's make sure we can meet the needs, especially of the poor and the needy. And again, the voice of the mom who sees strength in her son and says, do not waste it on yourself. Man, God's got a higher calling for you. And you're gonna be able to help the poor and you're gonna be able to help the needy, man. You're gonna bring a thriving atmosphere to our land. But it started out with a mother seeing strength in her son. You see that? I'm already trying to teach that to my kids. When we're going to school, I said, hey, I made the mistake when I was in third grade and I made a demeaning comment to a little girl who had glasses on. To this day, it haunts me. Did you know that I went back when I got saved when I was 21, I wrote her on Facebook and I said, I'm sorry for in the third grade that I said something to you. You didn't deserve that. And I said to my sons, you speak up for those people. You are going to be strong in your school and you're gonna see kids that other kids are gonna pick on and you're gonna tell them, no, that's not gonna happen as long as I'm in this class. And guess what? When we get older, we need to be the same way because there's people who need the strength of men to step up and to care. Sorry if I get passionate about this. This really matters. If the society needs something, it needs the strength to be set in the right direction. And again, rulers who think of the greater good, not just themselves, whatever that looks like, right? Okay, so now we've just gotten through nine verses and we haven't even talked about a woman yet. But again, P31, right? P31, everyone says this is the woman's Bible study. It's all about P31. I'm just telling you, the first nine verses had nothing to do with that. Okay, but now we're gonna jump into verse 10, right? And what you're gonna see is a baddie from the Bible, okay? So get ready for this because we're talking about a baddie of the Bible. I don't know if you're ready. I don't know if you're ready. Okay, so verse 10, it says that a wife of noble character, who can find? So just hold that question for a second because he's gonna get into a whole list of what a wife of noble character in this ideal sense actually looks like. But he notes that if you find her, she's worth far more than rubies, which is a big statement back then because if you had a handful of rubies, you had generational wealth, like you were gonna do well. And the wisdom here that's being said is even if you have generational wealth, you know what's better than that? A woman of noble character. Right, so so the statement he just made was really weighty and it also just begs the question, who can find this girl? This baddie of the Bible. Verse 11, watch this. Her husband has full confidence in her, right? He fully trusts her, doesn't lack any trust in her um, and because of her, he lacks nothing of value. Like, that's pretty bad, right? That's pretty awesome. He lacks nothing because of her. And watch this. Uh, She brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. That's incredible. So this girl likes phenomenal. Like even on her days off, she's on fleek. Everything about her, like, whoa. Oh, by the way, no, she don't take days off. Did you catch that? Because all the days of her life, she brings good. Whoa, dude. Some dude in the room right now is going, dude, where's that girl at? (laughs) Didn't you hear him ask the question, who can find her, right? So think about that for a second. Who can find her? The one that brings all the days of her life good. Man, that's a big weight, right? I think about myself, man, I can't even bring all the days. I can bring half the days good. But not the Bible, baddie. Watch verse 13. She selects wool and flax and works eager with her hands. So she can make cool stuff, y'all. She just makes cool stuff. That's awesome. 
Uh, verse 14, she's like the, uh, she is like the merchant ships that can bring food from afar. In other words, she's got the hook on DoorDash. She knows the best food in town, right? We're getting Chipotle over there. We're doing, you know, Chick-fil-A over here. Come on. We're getting it in from all the good places. Verse 15, and she also gets up while it's still nighttime. Whoa. Okay, and she provides food for her family and also portions for her female servants. Okay, so check this out. Not only is she bringing good every day of her life, she is also getting up, I think, 4.30 a.m., right? Because during the summertime, the, the sun's coming out around 5 something, right? Okay, y'all don't know about that. Okay, some of y'all don't know about that. Okay, if you ever get up early in the summertime, the sun starts coming up in the fives. But she gets up before the sun comes up. So she's rocking and rolling, 4.30, ready to rock. And then she's getting all the food. So she's meal prepping. Did you catch that? She's getting everybody's meals right, getting it all figured out. Hey, and then don't hate on her because she got Molly Maid helping out. She got some help. Hey, sometimes she needs some help. So don't knock on her. But what's awesome is not only did she have Molly Maid helping her out, she put snacks out for them too. Did you see that? So she cared for everybody. She said, hey, even if we're serving alongside each other, I'm no better than you. I'm hiring you, but I'm gonna put snacks and water out. Can I encourage you, if you're ever serving alongside someone, put some snacks and water out. So she has this kindness that says, hey, I'm no, you know, you're working for me, but I'm no better than you. We all need to eat and enjoy some snacks, amen? So it's awesome, right? Just being thoughtful. Watch this, verse 16. She considers a field and then she buys it. Like, what is this? Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. So she got a side hustle. She's selling stuff on Instagram. She got something going on. And then she's working on her garden in the backyard with that side hustle money. Again, who is this woman, right? Who is this woman? And then verse 17 she sets about her work vigorously, right? She's working hard and her arms are strong for the task. Well, she got strong arms. You know what that tells me? She don't hate on cardio and she don't skip weights either. She be working out. Her arms are strong. Well, who is this woman? Let's just be real. Can we be real today? I'm just reading from the Bible. Verse 18. And she sees that her trading is profitable. So, you know, she's just bringing in, you know, through, through good purchases, trading, and is bringing in more than she's putting out, putting, spending and stuff. And then look at this. Her lamp does not go out at night. Okay, so wait a minute. She's up at 4.30, but then she's up all night too? Who is this girl, right? And I've learned this about, like, moms are super moms, right? If you're a mom, you're a super mom. And I learned this about moms. They don't go to sleep at night. They just wait <laughs> till the next person needs them. You know what I mean? Shout out to the super moms. Just waiting, waiting. So again, her lamp is there at night. Verse 19, in her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. What that means is she doesn't buy clothes. It's one thing to buy clothes. Who needs to buy clothes when you make clothes? So she's over here making outfits for everybody, making them look all super fly. Knows each one, what do they need? Making the clothes for them. Uh, watch this in verse 20. Again, really important. She opens her arms to the poor and she extends her hands to the needy. And this is really cool because she has a heart, not just for her home, we've already seen that. Not for the people working in her home, we've seen that. But she also cares for the people outside of her home, right? And I want you to notice, this is the second time that that's come up in this chapter. In the beginning, it was Lemuel's mom saying, hey, you better care for the poor and the needy, right? And then here we get this ideal picture of this woman who also cares for the poor and the needy. Again, just a theme that's happening throughout the whole chapter. I like verse 21. This is cool. And when it snows, right, the weather outside is frightful, right? But the reality is it's not even frightful yet. She's ready for it before it even comes, right? So when it snows, she has no fear. She has, is not frightful for her household because all of them are already clothed in scarlet. 
In other words, she's got their, their clothes for, for winter and snow already ready in September. And she got them up in scarlet. They're in this red, like, well, a different red than this, but they're like in a red color. Which means she moms so hard that she already got their snow outfit ready and she knows if they're in bright red, I can see all them little stinkers on the hill when they're playing in the snow. I ain't gonna lose one of them. They're all coming home with me, you know what I mean? Genius, genius mom. Moms be thinking. So she got them in scarlet, ready for the snow. Verse 22, and she, okay, you guys ain't ready for this. And she makes coverings for her bed. Don't make me break this down. There are kids in the room. Okay, I don't need to get into what she's doing, okay? She's, she's excited about her husband. She actually enjoys her husband. She's, anyway, oh, gosh. And she's clothed in fine linen. Woo, do I gotta break that down? So she, she's dressed, she's excited to hang out, but what's really cool is she's not just preparing the bed and she's not just wearing something really nice. She's wearing purple, which by the way, that is the color of royalty, which, knows, which tells me this, she's confident she's a queen. She's got a confidence about her. She's not fearful of her man. She's not like doing this out of, she has a confidence about her. She's a queen of her house. She knows what she's doing, it's her choice. Amazing, like who is this woman, right? She's a queen, She's ro- she sees royalty on herself. Carries confidence. Look at verse 23. Don't miss this one. Her husband, okay, about time, is respected at the city gate and he takes his seat among the elders of the land. You know what this tells me? I don't know if you caught that here. So many guys go into marriage and over time they want to be respected, they want to be revered. Well, let me ask you this. If you want to be revered, are you a respectable man? If you want to be respected, ask yourself the question, are you respectable? Because I don't know if you caught that, the wife of, or the husband of the queen who walks with confidence is a respected man, both in his home and in his community. And not only that, It's not just him, it's who he surrounds himself with. I don't know if you caught that also, but he sits with the elders. You know who the elders were? The respected spiritual leaders as well. And so she looks at him and goes, I like you and I like who you hang out with because they make you better. Some of you guys, you don't even realize this. It is a turn off to your wife who you hang out with. She wants to be more excited about you, but you don't hang out with respectable people. And so if you want her to respect you, ask yourself, are you a respectable man and do you hang out with respectable people? Because that will matter to her who you hang out with. And so you get this picture of a respectable man who hangs out with respectable spiritual leaders, right? Verse 24, here we go again. She makes linen garments and she sells them. So now she's not only providing clothing for her family, now she's, again, side hustling on the side, selling some clothes that she made. Um, And then she supplies the merchants with sashes. She's just giving out little gifts, right, to the Amazon guy. Hey, it's Christmas, here's some cookies. Again, who is this? Verse 25, she is clothed. Okay, let's pause for a second, even though I think you can already read it. This is the first time we're talking about her clothing now. Because the entire time we've been talking about all the clothes she's putting on everybody else. And we've been talking about how baddie she is and all this stuff. But did you know when the Bible actually like goes, okay, now let's talk about her clothing for a second. It says that she is clothed in two things. Ready? Strength and dignity. That is what she considers to be of importance of what she's clothed in, covered in, descriptive of. This is what describes her. She's clothed in strength. She's strong and she has dignity, right? She's virtuous. And I love this. And she can laugh at the days to come. She can laugh at the days to come. To me, that's a big one. Because it's so common in Christian culture, and it's not just the ladies, it's the dudes too, that we're so afraid of the future. 
fear everywhere. Look at the, look who's there. Look at, look who's the president, the governor, the mayor, the, look, all fear. And yet the Bible baddie laughs at the future. Has a spirit of strength on the inside. A determination that like, dude, how many of you know we have a God who works in the unseen? It's not in what you see or hear, it's in what he promises us to be true. And she has a, a dignity inside of her and a strength inside of her that allows her to see joy in the future, not fear. But you have to know some things to be able to look at the future, even when it's grim or culture looks crazy, and to say, man, I actually have a different belief system than most, it's unfortunate, church people who are so afraid. But, but not her, she has a different view on things. And I just wanna say this too, I think this is really important to note, and I wanna really challenge specifically the younger ladies in the house today because there's gonna be an emphasis like crazy from Snapchat and TikTok and Instagram and all the things to make the primary focus of your life the physical outside of your body, what you look like. And there are so many people that we look up to in culture, whether they're singers or actors, and they're using a whole lot to make the outside look good, and really it's covering up a lot of weakness on the inside. And it is a constant temptation to use the outside to cover up the inside. We have not talked about what she looks like on the outside, but the Bible made it very clear she is clothed with strength and dignity. So that is the question to ask yourself. It doesn't start on the outside. It goes, hey, I don't want to use the outside to cover up a weakness. I want to be strong on the inside. How are we going to make that happen? And how are we going to see ourselves with dignity on the inside, right? Watch this. This is powerful. Verse 26. And she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. That's powerful because it's very common when we get together and everyone's chitty chatting that Someone will just burn someone to the ground and we all just jump on board. Yeah, picking up our stones, us Christians. But with her, she's like the person that speaks wisdom in the situation and goes, I'm not here to tear that person down. She's not even here to defend herself. And by the way, did you know wisdom always knows there's more to the story? Hey, did you know wisdom knows there's always two sides to every story? Hey, did you know wisdom can see things from different angles and not just one perspective? Did you know wisdom wants to believe the best about people and wisdom doesn't want to gossip or tear down? And when it says faithful instruction, that means bring God's word into the conversation. Faithful, not easy, faithful. And it's hard when everybody's on a rampage tearing someone down, but someone says, hey, I want to bring some like faithful instruction. We should, we should think the best about them or at least not be bashing them, right? So it's just incredible. This person who wants to bring God's word into a conversation where culture so easily just like slays people, right? Does everybody bash on them? But not here. She uses her words for building up, not tearing down. Look at verse 27. As she watches over the affairs of her household, she doesn't eat the bread of idleness or laziness. Her children arise and they call her blessed. Blessed. And her husband also, he praises her. In other words, they write her cards. They send her to the spa every once in a while. And they buy her gift cards to heirloom. They do all those things. That's a word for somebody in the house. Write that down. Write it down. Proverbs 31, 29. Many women will do noble things, but you, the person described in this list, right, surpasses them all. Watch this, charm is deceptive. Charm, that's like flirty, being able to talk really smooth. It will deceive you because that's the outside. It's not really the inside. And then also it says that beauty is fleeting, which again, getting in my mid-30s, I'm not saying I was ever beautiful, but I'm saying it's getting downhill pretty quick. And what I'm saying is no matter how beautiful you look in your 20s, 30s, Eventually, everything's going to change. Beauty is fleeting. Your body's going to change. Time comes at all of us. So if that's your highest value, okay, 
It's going to let you down. If that's the ideal you put on your spouse, that they're just physically beautiful, you are going to be let down. Just give it time. It's a matter of time before beauty flees from all of us, right? And so what else matters at that point? It says, but watch this. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. You see that? And it says right after that, honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works be praised at the city gate. I don't know if you caught that, but again, we're, we're closing out the final chapter, we're talking about this ideal woman. And the author here brings up something that was brought up at the very beginning. I don't know if you remember this, but when we launched into this whole series, I told you the keystone statement to the whole wisdom literature is this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. That was in week number one. It's to be in awe of the Lord, right? And then you'll understand how to live a wise life. And at the end of the book, here you have it again. What makes this woman awesome as you went through this whole list, even didn't even start with all those things. What started with is she lived in awe of the Lord. That's what started with her. She had this awe for the Lord. And, and a woman who, who lives in awe of the Lord, man, we celebrate that. We, we honor that. We say, man, that is what is the most important thing, right? Because, because uh, social media is not going to do that. that you're not going to get likes for being in awe of the Lord. And if you post pictures of you being in awe of the Lord, that just seems interesting. Okay? I don't know how genuine that is, but maybe I'm just being judgmental. Okay, so that's it, right? That's the superwoman of the Bible. And for... Hundreds of years, what they've been telling women in the church is study this and get better at it. And what women of the church have been feeling for hundreds of years is guilt. No? Yes. Maybe you're new to church. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. You don't know anything about what I'm talking about. It's okay. Because it's this list, and it's like, oh my goodness. But I, I, I had to tell you at the very beginning, I love all the P31 Bible studies, but you better not miss the context if you join up for one of those. Did you know Proverbs 31 was not written to women? Did you catch that? Proverbs 31 wasn't written to a woman. It was a mother writing to a son. Did you catch that? He said, hey, don't wild out and give your energy to women, plural. Don't get intoxicated. But what I want to challenge you, young son, to do is I want to give you a picture of this amazing woman, and then I want you to think about the man you could be that might ever be worthy of having a woman like that in your life. Proverbs 31 was a challenge to a young man. And how often we guilt the women about it. Amazing. And so he gets this ideal of like, oh man, because how typical is it of young men to make a checklist of all the women it's supposed to look like, right? She gotta look like this tall, she gotta have this, she gotta be this funny. And yet here you have this whole list and none of it is about that, it's all about her character and the question is asked, listen, are you even a man worthy of leading someone like that or being in a relation with someone like that? Or could help reflect those characteristics in yourself? Because it starts with you. What a deep challenge, isn't it? And it's easy for the men to twist it and be like, woman, live up to this. And yet it starts here. It starts with us. Again, asking yourself the question, are you a good and respectable man worthy to be a match for that kind of woman or to grow into that with them? leading the way. Because again, this checklist was noble woman. She's clothed in dignity and strength. She's hardworking. She's caring. She serves the poor. She's creative. She's a thoughtful parent. She's enjoyable as a spouse. And again, as, as a young man, you ask yourself the question, am I the type that that checklist would wanna be with? As I, I look at myself in the mirror, and so for years, people have been telling women, you need to be a P31 woman. I came to tell our church today, we need to be P31 men. That's where it starts. 
And you know, it's fascinating because again, you look at the context and again, it's written to Lemuel. Lemuel doesn't exist. So what that tells us is it's most likely a pen name. It's an identity placed on somebody as a representative of something that, you know, it's like a nickname, but more serious than that because in their culture, names had a lot of weight. And if you think about this for a second, okay, young boy who loses his dad, he becomes king at a young age. His mom is speaking into his situation. Hmm, who does that sound like? Solomon, the author of the rest of the book. Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? Well, then it, asks the, then it begs the question, well, what is Lemuel? Do you know what Lemuel means? It means to belong to God. And so she's placing on him what is so important because ahead of your life, you're gonna try to be the best that you can. I'm concerned with who you're becoming. I'm concerned with the woman you choose to be with. But all of that is secondary. The first thing I want you to know, listen to me, is that you belong to God. You are God's man. Because if you realize you're not the world's man, you're God's man, you're gonna live different in this world. I belong to God. Therefore, who I become will flow out of that. Because if we live belonging to the world, that will eat us up and it'll eat the people up around us. But when you realize, man, you first belong to God and first and foremost, out of my belonging to God, what a privilege that is, what an honor it is, that nothing can take me away from God, that I'm here for a purpose, that my strength on the inside doesn't come from me, yeah, I have a past, but God loves me still. <laughs> that my strength comes from God. That my dignity is not because of who I've been in the past. My dignity comes because God placed that on me. That belonging to God is something I'm invited into, right? It's amazing privilege of belonging to God. And again, you look at this chapter and you just think about it for a second. Because it describes this woman and nothing has to do with her character. It says that the greatest thing that all these things flow from is she lives in awe of the Lord. The same challenge that came at the beginning of the book. To live in awe of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. To be amazed at him. Which is why I tell you every Sunday when you come here, my goal is not for you to take three points and leave with them. I really want you to leave in awe of the Lord. Because if we leave here in awe of Jesus, man, we're gonna, we're gonna live wise lives. We're gonna live different lives. And so she's in awe of the Lord and who you belong to changes what you can become. And this is why I would tell single people too, when you're getting into dating, right, when you're single getting ready to mingle, it, it, it is so easy to get caught up in awe of that person. Awe, oh, awe, oh. or them to be all in awe of you. And then what happens is like two weeks in, you realize, oh, <laughs> you're a sinner too. Or you sin against them, but they were in awe of you and now they don't know what to do because they're, the bright and shining ideal person just hurt them. But when you're in awe of God because you realize you've been saved by grace, that you belong to him, that your strength comes from him. Well, guess what? When the sinner you married sins against you, you can do what you can do? Extend grace. Get better together. Say, you belong to me and I belong to you and we belong to God and we're gonna get through this. There's belonging, which helps us become. So again, the best thing you can do is put your heart in a position of awe of God and then let that put everything else in its place, and I want you to think about th this, this chapter for a second because this is, I love this, and I, I was hoping to do a different spin on, on this chapter because it's in the Old Testament, yet some people try to take it like, hey, this is how you need to be perfectly, and everyone's like, I can't. But it's in the, it's in the Old Testament for a purpose, right? And it's, it's helping us to understand, listen, you can try, but there's gonna be days where you're gonna fall. And you can't live up to this standard. And then you get to the New Testament, you realize, wait, hey, the standard wasn't just to be like the most virtuous man or the most virtuous woman. Listen, the standard is Jesus, and you're not even close. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But you know what that does when you realize it? When you realize this? It makes you press into the grace of God. And you go, man, I can't believe that God would come for me and he would give me his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. And when I fall, he would pick me back up and say, man, today your mercies are new again, right? 
Compassions, they never fail from God. So if I wasn't the husband I was supposed to be yesterday, praise God I got another chance today. If you weren't the woman you wanted to be yesterday, praise God you can be today. Let him lift your head and lift your heart. You know what Proverbs 31 is? It's so interesting when you get to the New Testament, did you know the church is called the bride of Christ? Proverbs 31 is the picture of the bride that Jesus deserves. You and I are the bride he chose. Even though he deserved the one that brings him good every single day. We're not that. But Jesus loved you so much, and this is the goodness of God and his love over your life that chases you down and never gives up and says, if you belong to me, even if the devil comes at you with everything he's got, he can't pull you from my hand. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. He he, he didn't put a figurative ring on our finger. He put his blood on the cross. That's how much he loves us, so that we can follow a victorious leader into the future. This is why the church is triumphant. Stop living in fear. Jesus is our king, he's our leader, he's guiding us, he holds the future. The church needs to rise up as the bride. We are not responsible for the future, the groom is. And we belong to him. We belong to Jesus Christ. And if you're thankful that you have a belonging today, you have a belonging to God, and I want to encourage you, let your belonging to God be the thing that shapes who you become. Don't live to please this world. It doesn't matter what's on the outside. It matters if he's given you that strength on the inside. And that starts with you inviting him into your heart, having him cleanse you of your sin. Realize that he conquered the grave. He's alive today. His spirit is with the church, with you. And as we do that, man, it's amazing how glorious. I think he's calling us into becoming a beautiful bride. But it'll happen as we rest and spend time with him. I want you guys stand up. We're going to enter into a time of worship. And I know that some of you are just going through some things today. You need clarity. You need, you need a faithful instruction prayed over you. We have a prayer team around the room. And they would just love it if you would make your way over there let them lift up your burdens that you have to the lord together this morning and then we'll give jesus the praise that he's worthy of let's pray jesus we just say thank you that you are the groom of the church that you are worthy of the best bride and yet you're so gracious that when we fall short you say you want us still and you've called us to belong to you belong to you belong to you and that's exactly What we have is this belonging. And so, Lord, I pray someone today would dive into that to realize you're never going to let go, that you're never going to end this with us, that you're in it for all of eternity. So we cling to you. We give you our lives as a way of just saying thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.